clarinets call for, but basically you have the four families of, of instruments, just like you find in a symphony. So put here, basically, Basically the same orchestration as the symphony. All right. Now, with Mozart, not only did he write 27 piano concerti, he also wrote uh, many other concerti. Um, five for violin and orchestra. And then he wrote um, a couple of flute concertos, an oboe concerto, a bassoon concerto. Uh, at the very end of his career, he wrote a clarinet concerto. It's very important for um, that repertoire. And he wrote four horn concerti. Um, he wrote double concerti, so for two pianos. So you don't find the use of the term uh, concerto grosso in the classical period, but instead um, in concerti that make use of multiple soloists, you find the term double concerto that has two soloists, or the term triple concerto. So you'll see um, when we talk about Beethoven that he wrote one triple concerto, which called for violin, cello, and piano as the soloists. But um, you know Mozart even wrote uh, a concerto for flute and harp. Um, one for glass harmonica. So anyway, he was very prolific in writing concerti, and he is the single most important of the uh, concerto before Beethoven. And so he really established the model for all later concertos. Even concertos that are written today have elements that are based on these um, Mozart concerti. And what we're gonna see in the first movement is that um, Mozart, presents an adaptation of the Sonata Allegro principle that we saw in the symphony. And this opening first movement form traditionally has been called double exposition form, which is synonymous with just the description of first movement classical concerto form. So we'll put here five violin, Concerti and then many others. And so, some different terminology and you know, definitely a different structure emerges um, in the classical uh, concerto, just like we saw with the symphony and that you're going to see in uh, the next section in, on chamber music. And when we talk about the string quartet, it will be the same situation. All right, so. So this double exposition form then takes into account the idea of having material for the orchestra and material for the soloist and then this inspired dialogue then that ensues. And so Instead of using the term ripieno, which I talked about ripieno as, as the term that describes the orchestra in a Baroque concerto grosso, the term tutti, which means all, everybody, so the term tutti is what's used for the orchestra sections. And in this first movement uh, concerto form, there are five tutti sections that you're gonna look for. The longest of which is the opening tutti, the way that the, that the movement began. So it begins sounding like a classical symphony. And then the tutti sections really frame the form of the movement. And so 
that we're going to have the same terms that were used in uh, describing the form of a first movement classical symphony, so exposition, development, recapitulation. But what's going to be added to that is going to be what occurs at the end of the movement, which we already talked about with the Bach Brandenburg, which is the uh, cadenza. But in a classical cadenza, you have many more expectations in terms of what's exactly going to happen there. And so we'll talk about that. All right, so this double exposition form features five tutti sections. And just one thing for a little more overview of the entire work, it continues to be a three movement genre. So concertos always were associated with this idea of an opening fast movement, which then in the classical concerto, would be double exposition. And then a slow movement, which would be a different key. So we'll put contrasting key. Very often we we'll use some kind of rondo plan, like, you know, a three part or five part rondo. So it's like, you know, a three-part rondo is a ternary plan, ABA, or five-part is ABA, CA, you have an extra contrasting theme. And that's what will happen actually in the, the uh, D minor uh, concerto, although we're not going to do that, that slow movement. And then the final movement, which was typically a rondo movement. Occasionally you have theme and variation, like the last movement of the C minor piano concerto, the Crucial 491 is a set of theme and variations. But usually it's a rondo movement and something that gives, you know, light, um, brilliant conclusion. So the, the longest movement would be the opening movement. And so that's what, what you expect is three movements, fast, slow, fast. And so the uh, structure that we're going to examine here is what's associated with the piano concerto and D minor. Okay, 466. The date of composition is 1785. And <clears throat> This is one of only two of uh, Mozart's concerti for piano that's in minor key. So, this also is a a uh, concerto that doesn't have a cadenza that was written by Mozart, it didn't survive. Obviously Mozart worked out a cadenza for it. Many musicologists think that he wrote it out because he wrote out cadenzas for many of his other works, but somehow it just didn't um, survive through time. And um, so when performers have to uh, you know, prepare the cadenza, then they have a choice to make with whether or not they're going to write their own cadenza, or if they will use another cadenza that's been written by other pianists and composers. Um, and so this particular um, concerto is one that was really important and popular with Beethoven. And so the um, Cadenza that Beethoven wrote for this concerto is the one that's that's traditionally performed. It's the most popular, and so I'll write here Beethoven. Um, actually, it was one of the few works that Beethoven performed in his lifetime that was written by someone other than himself. So Beethoven was uh, primarily performing his own music. So Beethoven wrote. 
a cadenza. And this is what you'll hear on, on the recording, is the Beethoven uh, cadenza. All right. Now, the way we're going to diagram this is to indicate the different sections that feature the orchestra, the two. And so this opening section of the D minor concerto then starts out straight away with the orchestra playing the A theme. And this is a very um, quiet opening. It has um, kind of an ominous tone to it. Um, these works that are in minor keys by Haydn in the 17, early 1770s, um, the term storm and stress is used to describe that. I think I mentioned that already. Um, and so it's, it's considered to be like a pre-romantic, more emotional um, work, because you know, primarily uh, Mozart wrote in major keys. So this D minor is, is, is important, same key as, as much of Don Giovanni, his, his dark, you know, uh, opera, one of his most important operas. Anyway, this opening theme is presented by the orchestra, and it's going to be associated with the orchestra in this first movement. It's very quiet, it then leads to a big um, statement by the entire uh, orchestra forte, and that leads to a half cadence, and it doesn't really modulate, it just, you know, then arrives on this, on this dominant chord, and then there's silence, and then a B theme is presented in the key of F major. And so that theme is big contrast with the A theme, and it's presented by the woodwinds. So this theme is relatively uh, brief. This theme is always going to be presented by the woodwinds throughout the movement. One thing that's unusual about this is that you expect this, that the B theme and, and the recapitulation would come back in tonic, but he doesn't do that. He keeps it in F major. And what we're gonna see is that once the soloist enters here, that when we get to this theme, the woodwinds present it, but then the soloist is going to present another B idea, which is then the idea that will be recapped in tonic. So, relatively brief there. Closing material, which is uh, very brilliant, very uh, exciting, and rather long. This is the longest passage within this opening um, to you, and the opening, you know, orchestra part of the exposition. But what's different about this passage in comparison to um, Sonata Allegro form in a symphony, first movement of a symphony, for instance, is that it returns to tonic and it doesn't stay in that second key like what you have in symphony. So the adaptation that Mozart makes within this concerto, uh, first movement structure, is that instead of using double bars and repeats, he, he eliminates that and he places the closing material in this opening section back in the tonic key to prepare then the entrance of the soloist. And so when the soloist enters, this is what corresponds to the repeat of the exposition, hence the name, you know, double exposition. So, when the soloist enters in this particular work, then, the soloist has a new theme. And so, this new theme starts with an octave leap, and you'll always hear that, and it's something that the soloist is going to um, really work with a lot in uh, the uh, development section. So, we're going to call this woodwind theme 
a B1 thing. <clears throat> and then we're going to write a B2 theme, which is the theme that's new that you didn't hear back in the exposition for the, for the orchestra, um, which also is in this same contrasting key. And this is presented by the soloist. It's been restated by the woodwinds. And then it leads to closing material. And then this always has virtuosic um, brilliant passage work. So for piano, concerto, you would expect to have lots of scales, or broken chords, or arpeggios, and that's what you'll see in, in, this, um, in this movement. And it ends with a trill on the dominant harmony of this contrasting key. So it's a 5-7, you know, of relative major. And he would use the stereotype pattern on this and would use Alberti bass accompaniment uh, pattern. And so you have something like this where you're going. And so there's a real clear cadence point at the end of the section that, um, that features the soloist. And then you have the second tutti that's in the second key. And then when the soloist comes back in, then that is when the um, development section begins. So, what we're going to do now is to listen to the exposition and we'll stop at the end of the exposition and this double exposition idea um, you'll hear and so as I as I play this for you you know we'll just be following along with this basic plan so that you can have You can have these, these uh, you know, basic themes in your in your ear. All right, here we go. So this is the orchestra A theme.
that's something new to the class of preparing.